Thank you for that welcome. I'm Stan Grant, here to give you some answers. One of the world's leading experts on war studies from King's College London, Sir Lawrence Friedman. Former Treasurer and former US Ambassador Joe Hockey. Writer, filmmaker and historian Santilla Chingepe. Chair of the Parliamentary Intelligence and Security Committee, Peter Khalil. And Chief Foreign Affairs columnist at the Financial Times, Gideon Rackman. Please make them all feel welcome. Uh, after the Holocaust of World War II, we all said never again. So why is Albanese shaking hands and smiling with the Chinese dictator Xi, while the genocide against the Tibetans, the Uyghurs and the Falun Gong practitioners is still going on? Santilla, what did you think? When mm, you it's that? a very good question um, and one that should be put to the Prime Minister and this government. Um, I, you know, obviously these sorts of things are very complicated and China and Australia's relationship has had a bit of a rough, rough patch the last couple of years and I can see that, you know, this government's trying to sort of um, repair some of that and that was probably part of that and I think these things are complicated. But I do think that a big part of these conversations that happen within diplomatic circles are about symbolism. And it mm. does say something to be seen publicly shaking hands with someone um, whose government um, is accused of very serious human rights violations, the Tibetans, the Uyghurs and various other things, including as well as, you know, dual Australians that are in detention in China, um, who, you know, many believe should be brought home. And these are concerns that should, um, that, that are very worrying. And, um, you know, uh, yeah, I, I, I agree. I think why, why was the Prime Minister shaking hands with uh, the leader of a country that has a very questionable human rights track record? Peter. Look, this is the first uh, meeting between, a formal meeting between the Chinese leader and Australian leader in, in some six years. Uh, and these international summits, they're the, the pinnacle, I guess, of international affairs where world leaders meet, they interact in this rarif rarefied atmosphere, really. Uh, and what they do and, and discuss really has an impact on shaping the world we live in. Um, the Prime Minister in meeting President Xi was an important meeting um, because dialogue is good, um, making sure that did, we talk with... Did he have to look so happy to be doing it? There was a big well, smile on his face. Well, I mean, that, you, know, you, you can make that kind of criticism about uh, a Prime Minister's face, but the important thing is, in the meeting, he was very clear that he, he would not resolve from Australia's national interests or our values, our democratic values, including human rights. And in the meeting itself, which, as I said, it hasn't happened for such a long time, it was important that he put forward Australia's interests around removing trade barriers, around human rights, which he did, around the, you know, detained Australians. And that's important. Now, that's up to the Chinese government to, to move the relationship forward. Uh, the ball's pretty much in their court. But the interesting thing about this is that Prime Minister Albanese has really practised a nuanced diplomacy. Um, you know, in the past, uh, I've been critical of the previous government because, um, you know, they've been quite bellicose, you know, you know beating their chest, um, kind of, you know, scoring domestic political points. But the Prime Minister's engagement is important because it's about the world that we live in. And at these international summits, it's important to actually put Australia's position forward and our contribution is shaping that world that we live in. I'm going to bring Joe in in just a minute, though. First, I want to bring someone in who has experienced China's treatment of Uyghur people, Saddam Abdusalam. Saddam, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Stan. Tell us a little bit about, about your story. You were actually on Q&A a couple of years ago and you were concerned then about your family. You've been reunited with your wife. You've since had another child. But tell us about your situation and, and leaving China and the concerns you had. Um, it's pretty, pretty shocking, especially for my wife, who has suffered for three and a half years. And my newborn son, he was, he was three years at the time, so I couldn't meet them and... Only, only way to contact with them is via in WeChat moment. And, yeah, it was pretty tough, but at the end, it's all done now. I've got the family here. My wife is safe. My son is safe. I've got a newborn son. Mm -hmm. And the only thing is, like, my wife's still struggling with, uh, like, what's happening in China. Like, for example, if she sees the police officers or sirens even, like, bring her memory back, like, what she's been going through in China. And, and, Saddam, you still have family there as well who are actually held in some of these camps that... that we yeah, my used of dad's genocide. brother, my, my cousin. To be honest, we don't even know she's in prison on the camp, but we haven't heard from him. And I lost all the contacts from my relatives. They all delete me from the WeChat. Apparently, 
contacting with the overseas people put them in danger. So they all delete me from the WeChat. So I don't have any information from my relatives at the moment. What question would you like to put to our panel? Uh, I mean, I know that Mr. Albanese raised the question about uh, Ching, Cheng Lei and uh, Dr. Yang. Mm. But how about the Uyghur Australian families? Like my friend Almas, he hasn't heard from his wife for five years now. And there's a girl called Mikra. She was born and raised in Melbourne and a healthcare worker. And her husband was sentenced for 25 years in jail. And there's so much Australian Uyghurs separated from their family members. And how about them? Peter. Um, I'm actually familiar with Saddam's case. Mm. I think I, I met with him um, a while back in Canberra or in, in, in uh, Parliament. Um, it's, it's our, actually, responsibility as uh, representatives in a democracy to stand in solidarity uh, with the Uyghurs, with, with people who are suffering hum human rights abuses. And I've spoken in Parliament on multiple occasions uh, in defence of people who are suffering these human rights abuses. So I think it's an important element of our foreign policy that human rights is front and centre. When we talk about the international rule of law, that includes human rights and a commitment to it. It includes um, the, the commitment that we make to protect people, including uh, refugees and others. So that's part of our foreign policy. Uh, Penny Wong, our foreign minister, has been pretty clear about the importance of that. The prime minister has been clear about the importance of that. I guess the question goes to, mm. you know, in not speaking to the Chinese leader for such a long time, mm. is it beneficial to the national interest well, to have me, that conversation on put, human rights? Let me put that question to Joe Hockey. Did it help the Uyghurs that Australia was in the deep freeze during the Morrison years? No. No. So did that, how, did that how say you, that Australia How do you got change it? behaviour if you don't speak to someone about their behaviour? So if we're not in conversation with China, which, by the way, is our biggest trading partner, mm. and there's, what, a million Chinese Australians living here, what, we're going to stop talking to China, to the leader of China? But, that, but that's precisely Maybe. what happened um, during the Morrison government, where the mistakes made here that led to that, that, that impeded well, in, the ability in, in, to have Well, they started under the Turnbull government, by mm. the way, which is, you know... Same, conveniently same, same, same political stripe. Well, that's true, but, I mean, it, you know, it, 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 it was very good under Abbott. So, look, whatever the case, Australia's been doing the right thing. It's been standing up to a bully. And we won't be bullied by China. And whoever's the Prime Minister, whether it's Anthony Albanese or, or Scott Morrison or Turnbull or Abbott, whoever it is, they're putting Australia's interests first. We call it the national interest. What it is, is as Australia's self-interest. And it is in our self-interest, our national interest, to communicate with China. Of course it is. Uh, Gideon, if you're listening to Saddam, at others as well, we heard the first question from Bob Vinicum. Is there a trade-off here? Do you say that a country like China is just too powerful, too important to ignore, even if we find aspects of their human rights odious? Well, I think it's, it's inevitably a complicated relationship because it is such a powerful country in military terms. You have the economic relationship and you have the human rights aspect. And you're never going to allow one of those to completely overshadow the other two. You, you have to keep them all in balance to some extent. When you're talking about extent. genocide, which is what has been, China has been accused of with the Uyghurs, can you look past genocide to shake hands and smile at, because it's an important trade relationship? Look, I think the reality is that is what everybody is doing. Nobody has cut off relations with China completely. But I think it's also not the case to say that China is getting off completely scot-free, even on the Uyghurs. I mean, if you look in Europe, they lost a very important trade deal with Europe that they'd been working on for a couple of years on precisely this issue. There was a tit-for-tat. The Europeans sanctioned some Chinese officials because of what they were doing uh, in Xinjiang. The Chinese counter-sanctioned. And at that point, the European Parliament said, we're not going to let this trade deal go through. So it's not the case that it's all flannel and we say we raised human rights and mm. then it's business as usual. I think the Chinese have paid a price and they'll continue to pay a price for what they're doing. But, but Sir Lawrence, as someone who studies war, does this remind us that we have a power-based order and that might can prove right, or might at least proves that you have to be listened to? Might proves that you have to be listened to. You can't ignore another's power. You get into trouble 
if you do. And we've got to be clear, this is not just a China problem. We've got an issue with Saudi Arabia, we've got an issue mm. with Qatar, at the, with the, running the World Cup. Uh, what sort of relationship are we going to have with Russia after what it's been doing uh, to Ukraine? So it, it, it's not unique to China. And I think in, in all these cases, uh, I think the starting point should be confidence in our own systems, in our own, in our own values, a recognition that we haven't always been uh, to the top uh, in meeting the standards that we sometimes set for others and got to be careful about the risk of hypocrisy and double standards. Um, so it's always going to be a balance, as everybody has said. But I think the starting point should be confidence in, in ourselves and in our own system. Uh, and that's the starting point. And let them work out how they have to deal with us rather than mm. we spend all our time working out how to deal with them. Galia Vaskudanova um, is with us tonight. Now, you've been in Australia for about three and a half months and you fled Ukraine. You were telling me before we came on about the scene at the, air, at the, the train station when you were trying to get out. What was that like? Yeah, so when I decided to evacuate, I decided that when uh, they uh, bombed area close to my house, you know, just less than one kilometer from my house, they bombed our TV TV uh, tower and part of uh, Russian missiles just fell uh, 200 meters from my house and destroyed the building. So, yeah, so the, I decided to, to evacuate. Yeah. yeah, And when we came with my mom to the train, train station, it was completely full of people. Some of people... Uh, just spent several nights there because they uh, couldn't uh, got, get mm. on uh, to the train, you know. But and you uh, couldn't get on. Uh, I couldn't get on. I didn't know where to go. I didn't know where we, we will sleep because it was 13th day of the war and uh, most of uh, accommodation in, Aust in all western cities in Ukraine were completely full. I looked for accommodation and I didn't find it and I also didn't know where to go. So we decided just to go in the western direction in some city anywhere and just find out, find, find, find some place there. And when we, we were alive, Lucky, and we get on the train, and it was completely full. F people were sitting on the floor, uh, even on the train vestibule. Mm. Do you know what mm. you mean? And uh, uh, so. Uh, we were just with a small backpack because it was impossible to get on the train with the luggage, you know, and mm. most of people lost it. And so when I when I was already on the train, my, I messaged my friend that I don't know where to go. And she told me, I'll ask my friends. And in five minutes, some guy who, have, who has never seen me before called mm. me and told me, you can stay in my apartment wow. as much as you need. And we stayed there three months with my mom. You got out, but your mum is, is still there. Are you in yes. contact with her? How is she? Yeah, I'm in contact with my mom, and uh, uh, she uh, didn't want to go to Australia because she um, it it could be quite difficult for her because uh, because he doesn't she doesn't speak English and. Uh, so now I'm really worried about my mom because mm. situation is getting worse, you know, because winter is coming in, and Russia try uh, to do like huge humanitarian crisis in Ukraine. They bomb uh, all our infrastructure mm. all the time. And now lots of city without electricity, no electricity, no heating, no water. Also in my mom's city from time to time in Kyiv from where mm. I am, you know, sometimes no, 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 no water, no electricity, no heating. So it's getting worse. Mm. Just two days ago, they launched more than 100 missiles to Ukraine, you know? And, and Galia, you have a question directly for Peter Khalil. He's here from the government tonight. Could you, what is that question? Uh, I don't really have a question. I just want to ask you, uh, please give more weapon, weapons to Ukraine. I know Australia has already helped a lot, but we are fighting not for our country. We are fighting for democracy, for human rights, for all Western values, for Western world, for, of world, for all Western world. Just help us, you know. And also one more thing, one more, one more thing which I want to ask you. I, you stopped a humanitarian program for Ukrainians. Now we are not allowed to apply for humanitarian visas, but situation is getting worse. Winter is coming. So please mm. reopen this, this program because 
I want my friend, I want my family to join me here and apply for humanitarian visa. Thank, thank you, Gulia. Good luck to your mum um, as well. Um, send her best wishes if you get to talk to her and Peter. Thank you, Galea, for, for sharing your story and, and, and the horrible experience that you've been through. And I'm glad Santilla raised the human dimension as well. We've heard it firsthand from you because we talk about the invasion, we talk about the breach of the UN Charter, we talk about these abstract principles, uh, you know, a, a, a dictator invading <laughs> a smaller neighbour, a smaller country, but they have laid waste to Ukraine. Tens of thousands of people have died. Their own we, soldiers we, have we, died. But the and, direct question was, what are you going to do to help and, people just and, like Leah and, and her friends? And, and the humanitarian program, I'll, I'll check on that, because we did open up humanita additional humanitarian places and visas for Ukrainians. That's something that's been in consideration. On the, on the aid, Australia is one of the, the largest non NATO military contrib a contributor to um, Ukraine. We continue to provide support that's in constant consideration. We made further announcements about trainers uh, for Ukrainian forces. There's additional humanitarian aid. That's important. It's important that we continue that, uh, that assistance because I agree with you. You are fighting on the front line for democracy, for the values that we talk about tonight, like human rights and democracy. People are dying for that on the ground and it's really our responsibility and obligation to, to support you in that effort. As the international community has supported mm. Ukraine, it's been a remarkable effort to support Ukraine in this struggle to defend their lives, to defend their country, and we need to do more and we'll continue and, to look, look at the, the aid that we provide. Just on doing more, Sir Lawrence, mm. what more could be done? Because there have been at times direct calls for foreign troops to go into Ukraine and fight on the ground. So that takes us back to the nuclear issue because to some extent it's a myth that nuclear weapons haven't been used in this conflict. They've been used right from the start by Putin because the threat that he has posed is to raise the nuclear issue if there is direct foreign engagement uh, in support of the Ukrainians, not the assistance that we're all given for which we should give more, but troops on the ground. Uh, and that has been respected by, by NATO. Nuclear deterrence has worked, which is one reason why I'm not sure he would want to jeopardise that. And then we've also heard how you don't need nuclear weapons to terrorise a population. There are all sorts of other ways by which you can make life miserable. And then you come to the conclusion, following from the, the previous question about negotiations, if that's difficult, then the only way to bring this quickly to an end is to give Ukraine the maximum amount of support. Uh, and it, I don't think... We're what does that... Well, I think, you know, they, they need modern tanks. They, need, so they, they could do with some more aircraft. They need ammunition. Uh, and the it, Europeans have to step up. Well, the Europeans... I mean, they've been terrible. Well, well, I don't think that's wholly fair. Well, uh, well no, I don't think it is. But the Americans have spent... $25 billion helping Ukraine. Britain has spent $5 billion. And if you exclude Poland, Britain's contribution of $5 billion is more than the rest of Europe combined. Mm. The rest of Europe combined. I'll, I'll, I'll go to know, Gideon so on that. What, what more should or could be done? And Gideon, to that original point, how or even when does this end? Well, I mean, on the, on the military front, I think, you know, it, it's right that Europe, and particularly Germany, has been very, very hesitant. For their own historical reasons, they're very antsy about getting involved in, with German tanks shooting at Russian troops. It's kind of... But I think they, they need to get over it, really. Uh, they've been... And the French. Yeah, the, the French a little bit have uh, been French a bit more forward, French but I mean, Lawrence would know more than I about exactly what kit's been provided. But but yeah, I think broadly speaking, there is a, there's a danger for the West in that the you know now you have a Republican House, they'll begin to say you know this exactly. war's actually in Europe. How come America's spending more? America's sending more, and I so that so the Europeans are going to have to. Shift. I'm an American citizen and voter who moved to Australia in mid 2019 while Trump was in office. With Trump's campaign announcement yesterday, I'm really concerned that many people think Trump could possibly get elected again, when in reality he absolutely could, even if his chances have diminished. So my question is, how do we fight complacency in an electorate where, vo where voting isn't compulsory? Santilla. Oh, that's a very good question. Um, look, I, I mean, I, I, I watched the announcement um, yesterday, which I found quite interesting. I just want to... Um, hear Joe's take on this, since um, I know that you played golf with Trump at some point. Um, <laughs> but... on, on more than one occasion. 
But no, because I, I, I found his language in that press conference to be really, really quite interesting because it seemed like a, 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 a more subdued version of the Trump that we're sort of used to. And I thought that part of it was him making a point because clearly, you know, Ron DeSantis has, has come to the fore as um, the preferred Republican candidate for 2024. Um, and Trump is clearly playing on his popularity and the fact that he was using language that was talking about this movement and bringing the movement of people together and sort of putting himself on the, mm. on, on the back on the on, on, on the back side of everything was 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 really quite interesting. It was interesting hearing his language um, and how that's going to play out and whether or not his popularity will be enough to um, uh, build that momentum and get him that Republican Party support because clearly mm. um, the Republican Party see Ron DeSantis as their front runner. Joe. Mm. Well, it's a good point. He was very measured in the press conference. <laughs> How was yesterday. he on the golf course? Uh, oh, you know, he's he's quite engaging. I mean, he's, <laughs> you know, he doesn't cheat. Really? Um, <laughs> really? No, really. No, really. <laughs> Bill Clinton cheats on the golf course. <laughs> he likes to play the same shot five times. Well, but, although, um, of course, Do Donald Trump accused everyone else of cheating, didn't he? Well, well that's right, of course. And, and, yeah. and you, Joe Hockey, said there may have been some truth to the idea. That there was conspiracy at the 2020 election, didn't you? Well, no, I didn't say that. Oh, no, no I think, no, I think, not, I think, I think I've right. got the quote. <laughs> no, you, were, you, right. you were asked Come on radio, on yeah, you were asked yeah. on radio, was it possible that was there was... Was it possible? And, oh, for sure. The question is whether it is enough to change the election outcome. Yeah. You also questioned, you said it was hard to believe that 93% of voters in DC backed Biden. That, that does because suggest that conspiracy is afoot, doesn't it? Well, no, not conspiracy, because what do you have is voter suppression. And, and, you know, let's be real about it. I, I am strongly opposed to this voluntary voting system in the United States because mm -hmm. it means that both parties are trying to roll up their base with the most extreme language to get them to vote. And what happens... What should happen is what happens in Australia, that we battle for the middle ground, the middle vote. In America, it's quite interesting, at the midterms, the Republicans won five million more votes than the Democrats in these midterms, and yet it was a close result. And it was because independent voters were abandoning the Republican Party, primarily because of Donald Trump. Mm. Well, hold on, you, and, you, you, and dodged, you dodged Stan's question, though, Joe, because that statement, I recall that, with the ABC I, as well, I recall though. that statement yeah. at the time where you questioned the high vote for Biden. Mm. It was actually 87% in Washington, no, D.C. No, it was 94%. No, it was actually 90% when Clinton... Um, four years earlier. But the problem with you making a statement like that as a former ambassador, a former senior cabinet minister, with all the disinformation and misinformation and undermining of democracy, it just added fuel to that fire. And you should have known better about that. Um, we are facing a battle uh, between authoritarianism and democracy around the world. And our democracies, many democracies, are being attacked at home. The disruption, the degrading, the diminishing of our systems and our values. OK, now we've... Thankfully, here, had a really strong bipartisan pushback on that with, with countering foreign interference laws and other cybersecurity laws that we're building up. But we have a responsibility to actually protect and defend democracy, not to question and even skirt on the edges of conspiracy theories. And that, that I think, is a problem. So, let me get back to the, the question. Well, you didn't so, okay. the, the, You know, thanks for that, Peter. It's, but, You're welcome. But, but, <laughs> let, let me just get back to it. So, the issue, the fundamental issue is... The Republican Party now is going to have a hell of a civil war between uh, the Trump forces and the people that want to claim back the Bush, Reagan type of yeah. Republican Party. It's going to play out over the next two years, and and it will be it, it will be Ron DeSantis on one side. And Trump on the other. Well, I want to bring Gideon Rackham yeah. because you've written a lot about this. You've written about the, the, the strong man and the political, you know, the appeal of the political strong man. Mm -hmm. Can Trump get elected president again? Yeah, I agree with the question. I think he can. I mean, I don't think... Sure. It, I think it's looking less likely than it did a week ago, but he's... I think he's still probably the front-runner for the nomination, particularly if you have a large field. If it's just Trump, DeSantis, maybe he'll, he'll lose. But if uh, it's a winner-take-all primary, there are five Republicans running against Trump, he, he can win the primaries. Then, if he gets the nomination, he's running probably against an 82-year-old Joe Biden with high inflation. You know, any Republican would have a chance of winning under those circumstances. I think we are learning that, as mm. Joe said, that he is turning off middle-ground voters. Mm. So, 
a different Republican would have a much stronger chance. But if Trump gets the nomination, he's definitely in with a shout. Santilli, so um, you, you've lived in the United States, haven't you? You've spent significant time in the United States. I was interested in something you said, which goes to the, the division. And we know that it's a, a country that is deeply divided, whether it be class or geography or race, and that you felt unsafe there. Tell us about I that. I did, I did. I, um, and I wrote a piece about it for The Monthly, which I essentially talked about the failure of the uh, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade travel advice, because they do give specific travel advice for queer travellers, elderly travellers, and, um, mm -hmm. uh, and, and women travellers. But sometimes, <clears throat> but when it comes to cultural, religious and racial um, diversity, there is no specific travel advice. And so I was uh, travelling to a very uh, remote part of the US, which was predominantly white. It was 98% white. Um, and I felt, and it was two hours away from a town, so it was in upstate New York, it was two hours away from a town called Buffalo, where mm -hmm. early in the year there was a shooting where 10 black people were killed. Mm -hmm in a race um, attack. Um, and I looked to my government for advice about how to move in that environment because, you know, racism is everywhere, it's here as well, but it is very different in different contexts. Mm. And it was, how do you move in those spaces? Are you equipped? And I felt it very acutely in the US. You felt unsafe? I felt absolutely unsafe in, in that environment, in a bigger liberal city like New York or LA. It's very different because it's very diverse and there's certain spaces that you can move in. But when you are in an environment where, you know, it's, it's, it's very remote, it's very isolated, You've got white people, you know, driving around in these big trucks and, you know, they've got guns. Um, and, you know, when I'm walking down the street, I am black. I am not Australian. I am a black person in America. And that I take on everything that, that comes with that. Um, and so, yeah, it was, a, it, was a, it was a very, very interesting experience. And it was something that I sort of thought that um, I wish my government thinks a lot more about. But um, to the question around and to the point around um, what's going on with the US with democracy and the undermining of the electoral system there, um, particularly with the midterms, what we've seen, whether it's with the Republican Party and the gerrymandering and all of that sort of stuff. I want to ask Peter because, you know, the Australian government, we clearly have a very close relationship with the US. We have, that's a strategic relationship. And the way things are playing out in the US, um, it is going to get messy and it is going to get complicated, but we are signatory to this alliance, which makes us in many ways mm. beholden to the political decisions that, that the US makes when it comes to foreign policy. And I wonder at what point does Australia begin to rethink, or at the very least reimagine what that relationship looks like? Because, you know, with the Republican Party, someone like Ron DeSantis um, might not necessarily be very keen on backing Ukraine, for example, you know, and all sorts of other foreign yeah. policy decisions. And will Australia just sort of, um, you know, be in lockstep with the US, irrespective of the, 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 the political party or the president that's, that's in charge? And when do we start to consider our own values mm. um, and sort of go, well, mm. that's not really right? That's a good question. I, mean, I, I think the, the, the alliance, of course, is an important one. It's an important strategic and security alliance. Uh, there's always, always a debate about how independent Australia's foreign policy is. And I, I think, particularly in our, under our government, we do have an independent foreign policy to the extent that we are focused on Australia's national interests. And that doesn't always align with our partners or our allies. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but the important point is that we are focused on what is important to us. And with respect to, to the US, I mean, you, you know, the, the previous administration, the Trump administration, there were concerns around some of the policies, uh, some of which weren't implemented, like wanting to, you know, leave the Korean Peninsula, which would have left a hole, or, or um, but, but things like you know, diminishing the WTO and the rules, tra uh, rules around trade, which are important to us. Um, you know, I was critical of that at the time. Um, so we don't always agree with, with the US uh, and their system is decentralised. There's a lot of inconsistency in their inconsistency in their voting, state to state, county to county. Thank thankfully, in Australia, we have an independent electoral commission and we have compulsory voting, which is really, really important. It gives a resilience to our democracy that some others might not have. But every democracy is different. Mm. And, and I think the relationship with the US is an important one. We welcome the Biden administration's commitment to the Indo-Pacific and to human rights and to uh, a liberal rules-based order. Uh, and we're working very effectively with, with, with President Biden and his administration. Um, but it's always about, it should always be about Australia's so, national interest first. So just on Australia's national interest, who should the next ambassador to the United States <laughs> go? <laughs> well, that's a matter for the Prime Minister. Mm. <laughs> Any names that you'd like to suggest? I mean, Kevin Rudd Joe Hockey talked about it. Kevin Rudd. will say that. Um, well, I thought we liked the Americans. Why would we think <laughs> Kevin Rudd? I mean, it's like... <laughs> well, 
I think Julia Gillard would be great, mm. uh, to be honest. Um, you know, the main thing is that uh, whoever is what the... What would she bring? Oh, look, I think, uh, I think Julia Gillard's been exceptional since she retired as Prime Minister or lost the, lost the, election, lost the job. Um, and I think she's held herself with great dignity and uh, she's measured. Uh, she wouldn't... She, she, you know, the Washington Post is incredibly powerful and you've got to be totally in lockstep with the Prime Minister. And I, I would urge the Prime Minister and the Foreign Minister uh, not to appoint someone who would want to run their own foreign policy out of... Washington, so, D.C. So you, you, you're ruling Kevin right out. Oh, I'm not ruling him <laughs> out. That's, that's a matter for Anthony Albanese. But there are, there are a number of very good and talented people. And, um, but I would emphasise they should be a former political figure because you can go up the hill to the Capitol Hill and it, there is a dialogue between politicians that is not there between mm. politicians and public servants. And the, the countries that have public servants as their ambassadors in Washington... They fall behind. That's all we have time for. Thanks to our panel, Lawrence Friedman, Joe Hockey, Santilla Chingaybe, Peter Khalil and Gideon Rackman. Please thank them. <laughs> and a big thanks to those of you here and at home for shaping tonight's discussions, for also being so generous uh, with your stories as well, those stories that tell of the human story at the heart of so much of, that we were discussing here tonight. Next week we'll be live in Melbourne. We're going to discuss the NDIS. How do we put a price on supporting people with disabilities? Joining me, disability rights campaigner Ellie de Marchelet, Minister for the NDIS, Bill Shorten, Shadow Assistant Treasurer Stuart Robert, the Greens Disability Rights and Services Spokesperson Jordan Steelejohn and economist Amy Oster. Go to our website. You can register there to be in the audience. I'll see you then. Good night.